unified communications, find out why they selected the products that they did, and take a look back at whether or not those products met the uh, criteria that they were using to select the product in the first place. So representatives, uh, the, the panelists are representing four companies in three different verticals. We've got uh, Sean Billings, the director of IT from Pythian. We've got Skip Bachman, who's a system administrator for network infrastructure at Francis Tuttle Technical uh, Center. We have William Hayes, Senior Vice President, Platform Development IT for Sylventa, and John Fulton, ITS Director, Network and Systems for Lafayette College. So I'm going to start uh, with uh, Sean. I get the luxury of going first, so I'll make it quick so these guys can have a lot more time. <laughs> um, basically, uh, just to give you an overview of Pythian real quick, uh, we are a remote database support organization. We are probably, I think we're now officially the largest group of database administrators in one company in one, you know, that support multiple different groups outside of IBM. IBM is the next big guys. We're about 100, 280 DBAs now. Um, Expertise, SQL, Oracle, MySQL, and now we just added Mongo. So, you know, that's a big plus. All of a sudden, our database, our phone system rides on. We're experts in. Go figure. <laughs> um, global scale, we're uh, globally scaled. So, basically, we offer our clients 24 7 support. You can get a hold of anybody, anywhere. Our staff is located in 22 countries worldwide. Uh, so, you know, and we spread it out across that. So we're uh, able to get a hold of our clients, are able to get a hold of somebody in their specialty area, whether it's SQL, MySQL, Oracle, anytime. And uh, the joy about that is, is, you know, 80% of our staff are home-based, which kind of makes this whole UC stuff a little bit scary with cameras because we're going to have to change the dress code for home-based users because you have to wear something or have you know, upper stuff on, so it's going to be quite odd. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, last year, just to show how we've done it, last year we added 100 heads, and this year we're adding another 100 heads. That's our growth plan. We're already halfway there, so we're, we're growing quite rapidly. Um, our challenge was to bring our, our phone system up to a, you know, a level where it can support our aggressive growth, but also uh, provide our end users with the excellent voice quality along with the rip uh, feature rich platform, right? So, because our people are remote, we had to make sure, you know, we relied on VPNs, uh, people's home wireless, and stuff like that. So, we had to try and find a system that could support all that. Um, we, were, we were ultimately uh, replacing a very aged system. Some of the key requirements, of course, scalability for growth, excellent voice quality again, um, ease of management, ease of deployment, the feature risk, you know, mobile apps presence, voice conferencing, user management, distributed architecture, and of course, uh, that should be a TCO, sorry about that. TCO over three years are really good return. Makes it slide right into SIPX easier, it's pretty, pretty easy, or slides right into their model. Um, I mentioned most of the stuff, the issues that we came across. We had a very aggressive growth plan. Growth plan. Current system couldn't handle it. It just couldn't do it. Um, the architecture was built by you know, a bunch of DBAs. You know, before uh, I was hired on, a DBA was the director of IT. So when it's time to grow and the infrastructure came out, he was like, what do I do? Um, so the current team's knowledge of you know, the old system was very limited. So we just decided, listen, let's not try and figure this thing out. Let's try and figure something new. So we went off and did that. Um, this, the architecture was single server, stuff like that. No, no redundancy and no UC. There wasn't even talk of that at the time. Right. So one of the things that were thrown at us was the idea of how do we bring this global group of people that are all detached from the mothership and how do we bring them in and make them feel like they're part of the group. And we said, well, we have to find some way to get video conferencing in this chat. We have to bring them into the group and make them feel whole because, you know, half our people haven't even met each other face to face. Remote, they're all remote, remotely. You got people in Romania and stuff like that. They don't even see each other. Um, and of course, the old system wasn't up for hardware refresh, so we had to do something. 
did a, did a big case study, you know, tried to compare. We uh, compared like the asterisks, the shortels. Um, I came from the big enterprise operation, so I knew the Cisco's, the Avaya's, those were out because just their cost to a smaller company like us. So we, we did some comparisons to that, and you know, Isus, you know, based on the older 4.6, the 4.4 code came in, you know, pretty good with the promise of 4.6 would bring, bring better. So Isus slid right in there and filled that void, and we just jumped right in. And after some uh, chit chatting with John and the sales team and some other reassurances, we jumped right in. Um, right now, our deployment is two initial sites. We have a site in Ottawa, Canada, and Australia. We're uh, about 300 internal, 130 uh, internal IP sets in Ottawa, and 110 remote VPN sets worldwide. So you know, we're set up to uh, try and leverage so leverage our infrastructure as much as we can. We're trying to uh, right now we're running off of one signaling server in Ottawa. We're trying this out, you know, because we're in just a in the process of deploying our Australia site. So we're doing some experimentation with our production system wide at the same time, which has proved a little bit uh, a little bit challenging. Uh, one of our big challenges is our own network. We fall in the idea that the uh, you know we should have did the audio code stuff ahead of time, right? We're one of those guys that said, oh, 20, you know, hindsight's 2020, right? Um, our complex network has caused us a lot of grief, caused us some really bad pains. Um, we've had to do a lot of hole punching and figuring out why calls failed and why this call doesn't talk to this one, why this phone, internal phones only talk to this phone, and we did a lot of that. But we've, we've made it through. Um, latency with the uh, IPsec tunnels has been a big issue, right? Latency is always a problem with when you use VPN, so we have to figure out a better way to solution that, and now we can with some of the stuff coming up. Um, there's our current state. Very easy. We're up to 4.6. We have 4.6 installed. We're running on 4.6 now. Um, it's vir fully virtualized in our environment. Um, we are in the process of whether deciding whether we're going to light up the server fully in Australia to be to allow us to have a redundant node or not. So it's going along. And we're just testing our qual call quality between Australia and Canada right now as a test. We have about 10 users on the system. You know, with dial plans, whether they dial locally in Australia and come come across the pipe to uh, Canada to do their local, their uh, calling in North America and stuff like that. So we're in the process of doing that right now. Just a rough diagram of our architecture. You know, it's nothing fancy. Just a lot of VPN, a lot of internet use of internet. We use internet very well. <laughs> Um, there are some current issues we're working with, and we're, we're working with Dave's team to do some issues, right? There's some stuff. Like, we are very interested in the, the uh, unified communications. We really want that, and we've been really pushing. That was one of the main things that came on. I wanted the chat. I want the video. I want the package. Now, I've was basically my CEO said, give me it. Give it to us all. So we're at the point right now where we've, we've taken care of all our basic call issues. We've said, OK, we can give you basic calling. We can give you basic voicemail. We've given you user management. You know, we give you a couple little extra bells and whistles where you can go in and manage your own, your own uh, voice box out of the web and stuff like that. We've done that. Now we're at the point where we have to, we have to show me the money step right now for our for our executives right what are we doing get the bang for the buck stuff so this is why you know and uh, we're working with dave and those guys are saying we want to get this going we want to get the chat going we want to decide what we want to use and force you know and go to the next step because we're one of those companies that are really going to push it our, our users demand it our users are very demanding and most of them it's hard to work in that environment where most of your clients that you support might know more about the system that you are supporting right because they're pretty smart people. Uh, our future plans is we're, we're going to add some, you know, third and fourth sites, you know, probably our UK data center, maybe in India, uh, do some clustering. Uh, definitely put a contacts center in to replace our local hunt groups. Um, replace the remote sets VPN that we're using right now because there's a lot of overhead on those and call quality goes down a little bit by using that uh, with some maybe uh, TLS or SRTP. Mobile SIP client is huge, right? The ability to have that capability to just carry your phone around with you and be able to move around, it's, it's, it's very important to us. And then, of course, we're doing our integration. We have Active, Active Directory and RSA, 
uh, our internal ticketing system, our own system. We want to integrate that into our own call system so it can reference our own database for like if a client calls in, can talk to our um, can talk to our uh, on-call database. So it looks at who's on call, calls the person right away. There's no issue with whoever can get a hold of the systems. And then we want to do the internal multimedia sir. Right now we shop that out to third party. We want to bring it in-house. Um, so ultimately for us, you know, we, we, we basically, you know, bought into it lock, stock, and barrel. We, we, we wanted it. And it's, for what we uh, have deployed now, it's doing, it's awesome. And Dave's team's awesome to work with and get that stuff. So it's exactly what we wanted. And we just want to make, you know, we're, we're one of those eager companies to move forward. We're probably pushing pretty hard to move forward. We're, uh, and it was good to come here and see the guys, like the Red Hat guys are right in the same spot we are. Right? They've delivered all their base functionalities. What's next, right? And uh, we're eager to move on to that, but it's done exactly what we've done. Cost effective, you know, we, you know, for the amount of, for the amount of money we put into it, the, the benefit right now to my team is fantastic. We can sleep at night, and that's the big thing, right? We can sleep at night now, and it's awesome. So, thanks. So did you hear that, engineers? We have a specialist down here that can help us with Mongo when we run into problems. So next, Skip Bachman. Hi. I'm Skip Bachman, and I'm a Cipix abuser. Um, I'm a network administrator or systems administrator at Francis Tuttle Technology Center in Oklahoma City. We're a career technology school, so we primarily service high school sophomores, juniors, and seniors in advanced placement uh, courses and as well as career training, uh, adult continuing education, and partnerships with business and industry to um, business and industry for career folk or for industry tra focused training. I think I went the wrong way. Sorry. Um, we have over uh, 30,000 annual enrollments uh, in our various program selections, so we're kind of expanding when the economy's down, while our business is booming, because people go back for retraining. So we've recently just completed the expansion of 200,000 square feet of new space in our uh, primary campus, and so we had to look at either expanding or replacing our legacy 15-year-old PBX system. Uh, fortunately, the board decided that uh, they granted us the budget to replace that system. So we uh, started on along the, you know, the, the program to, to look at alternatives. We had some um, pretty low uh, requirements as far as uh, system criteria. Predominantly, it was, um, you know, it had to match the pretty much the current feature set of the existing PBX, which was a difficult challenge. Uh, it had to be IP based because our copper infrastructure was approaching 30 years old and our two new facilities had limited copper infrastructure. It had to be budget conscious because as a public school, budget is, you know, is always a public perception. And we went live, we had to go live in four months from the time we started our project. So I have some crib notes here to keep me from, from chasing the squirrels, so uh, bear with me. Um, <clears throat> we basically had to do a, a district-wide uh, inventory so we could determine what was out there and what feature sets the, uh, the users were using. We uh, came up with uh, approximately 500 handsets. You know, the surprise was all of the ATA ports that were out there didn't realize that there were, you know, 50, 54 analog cordless phones plugged into the system on analog ports, uh, 48 credit card terminals, 42 fax machines. So we had a lot of ATA uh, legacy equipment to deal with. But primary features that were used, utilized the most were shared line appearances and call pickup groups. So we also went through a, an evaluation of uh, basically we had a, a kind of a short list of products to look at when I started on the project. Uh, so we looked at uh, the Barracuda Cudatel appliances, the PBX and SIP, Asterix, 
and of course CIPEX. Um, uh, I guess we started with a 4.2 version of the open source code. Had eight weeks to lab test uh, those four different products with uh, um, look at comparing their feature sets and ultimately uh, we selected the CIPEX 4.2 open source code predominantly because one of our senior managers is an open source you know, fanatic and if there's anything you can do open source for free, that is his preference. Um, one of the other factors that leaned towards uh, CIPIX direction was the fact that we had located a consultant to assist us in our deployment and, imp and implementation and ongoing maintenance. Uh, plus the fact that, hey, if it didn't work out, there's a commercial version available. And that's why we're here today. And a major university in a neighboring state was looking at CIPIX at the same time. And I just saw his presentation in the other room. And of course, it's low cost. Uh, we went through the basically the hardware selection was at the beginning almost predetermined to be Polycom, primarily because the, we had had Polycom analog conference phones throughout our district for years. Uh, all the rest of the equipment was, you know, basically s selected off of, you know, some uh, referrals, but uh, right off the approved hardware list. We did uh, start with CIPIX 4.2 open source in the virtualized environment on ESXi 4.1 with VMware. Um, we later determined that, uh, you know, that we have, uh, migrated that to a physical server. Uh, due to our short time frame, we had the four months to test and you know, implement before our first department moved into the new facility and needed dial tone services. So our planning and implementation was actually done in reverse order. So we actually stood up a server, you know, put uh, 100 us uh, 96 users on there, and uh, away we went. We tied it together with our existing PBX with a uh, Mediant 1000 PRI gateway with, uh, into our Tataran Coral IPX PBX. Uh, basically, I developed the curriculum and trained the staff. Um, and the original features or the users that went on at first were our best advocates as far as moving to the new phone system. Uh, like any organizations, we did experience some obstacles. One of them was the existing infrastructure, as most people will find out. Although my infra infrastructure issues were from the switch out to the uh, endpoint because we elected to deploy a dedicated voice over IP network. So even though we had been deploying Cat5 for even standard uh, digital PBX phones for quite some time, there were parts of our 30-year-old campus that were still Category 3 cabling. So we had to go through an infrastructure upgrade and we were building out the voice over IP network as we were deploying. That was actually when the network was done, then the deployment was done after that. Um, <clears throat> some of the, the uh, feature sets that we uh, had problems with was obviously uh, shared line appearances. We quickly determined you know, the physical limit of how many shared line appearances you can have on a Polycom 650 phone and it was nowhere approaching the 25 that we needed on each and every uh, phone in one of our departments. So we had to overcome a legacy mindset, you know, that came from the early days that every call must be answered by a human and then forwarded to that other person's voicemail, which was a, you know, situation that most of the other staff on the district just absolutely hated. They preferred to get to the voicemail of the person they couldn't find. And also, we were um, pretty dependent upon our ACD. And we had limited functionality. They just basically wanted to route calls to the longest idle agent, but they are very dependent upon their call reporting metrics. <clears throat> so we, uh, at four months into it, uh, we started uh, the, the process. We moved from virtual to physical. Uh, eight months into it, uh, we did the YUM upgrade to 4.4. Everything really got really kind of stabilized again, so we kept moving forward on our deployment. 
the whole time we're thinking, that, you know, that uh, we really need to carve out some time between our schedules and our consultants that we need to finish our DR plan, even though our DR site was not ready to, you know, to accept any equipment. At 14 months, we migrated the ACD department uh, to CIPEX. And they were the last department of our organization to move. And at that time, we had uh, 625 phones, 140 ATA ports, and 1,000 SIP registrations on our system, which consisted of a single physical uh, Dell PowerEd server. And we were basically cooking along pretty much fine. We had the uh, odd occurrence of some uh, busy lamp fields that uh, presence that were, you know, kind of problematic, but nothing, you know, outside of that. We took an additional four months to get rid of all the legacy analog equipment, and it was at the time that we moved the PRIs directly into the Mediant 1000 and started handling all incoming calls through our auto attendant that we started to see our system cascade and fail. So we started looking at uh, possibilities. Uh, one of those was uh, at the same time we, we got notice that our consultant, uh, we had lost them and we had to find a new one. So we turned back to eZeus, which was the original source. And John and his team came out to Oklahoma and showed us OpenUC and we were immediately sold. The unfortunate part is we lost our CTO in the same month and uh, administration said no major decisions until you get a new CTO. So Josh helped us out by expanding our existing four 4.4 infrastructure on their open source, and we're currently at a stable condition. While we go for, I think uh, my proposal goes to board in about an hour for approval, and we will be upgrading to OpenUC 4.6. So basically, what we learned in our little deployment was that you really need to do the planning and the deployment in the right mode. Uh, plan, plan, plan. You know, I've learn more about the whole open source. I'm a project manager, I'm not a coder, you know, so that was one of the uh, fallacies in coming up with an open source product is that, you know, we don't have the coder level people, you know, on my staff to be, you know, support it. Um, you know, so we basically determined that we need to have a consultant. We should have, you know, we should have let it be done in a turnkey solution. Um, and you know, maintain an SLA for ongoing maintenance, which is what we will be getting with the OpenUC. Uh, the winds coming from an old 15-year-old PBX that uh, had no feature sets, email notices with voicemail attachments was a really great feature, and uh, you know, the ability for people to go in and set their own options was really, really um, a big success for us. Um, since we had low expectations, our future is really bright on what we can do here. You know, the term you see, not even on anybody's radar screen, including in our own department. So I had to sell our own department on the benefits of the Unite client, and I've done that. And we will be uh, really, you know, moving full steam ahead with that, because as a technology center, we should be out there providing the technology um, you know, way in advance of, uh, <clears throat> you know, what our customer base needs. My overall impression of the, the CIFIX product so far is that when it's properly implemented, it is an outstanding product. And not being a coder, but I know that most of the coders are here in this room, and you guys deserve a really good round of applause. I have never been experienced in an open source, you know, organization like this. So it's kind of uh, very impressive to me on the work that you guys do. Thanks for inviting me to talk about our experiences. And uh, I, as, as you said, it's very important to have low expectations and a low hurdle to success. Um, and that way when you, know, you make your decision, and our decision was obviously ASUS, it looks great. Uh, everybody was super happy with how things turned out. Um, though, you know, you run into a few bumps along the way. Uh, so we're a small company, very high tech, uh, in Cambridge mostly. And uh, most, 
like I said, most of us are in Cambridge, but we do have quite a few telecommuters in uh, Israel and a few field locations around the world. Uh, and we also have customers around the world as well. So we do have to make sure that we can support that. You know, my background is uh, computational sciences, and I knew nothing about phones before I started this, other than, hey, I pick it up, I dial a number, and I'm good to go. So there was a bit of learning along this. When my CEO came in and said, you know, our phone system sucks, and we really need to do something about it, uh, we had an old Nortel PBX, and I'm not really sure which box that was in the data center, but uh, it's no longer there, fortunately. Uh, one, the things that we wanted were the ability to forward calls um, automatically to a cell phone. Just really simple. I really, 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 really wanted the ability to forward my calls to Google, uh, uh, Google Voice so that I'd have one phone number for everything. Uh, and the ability not to have to open up voicemail, uh, to have it pop up in my email, uh, that was a, it was a feature that a lot of us really loved. Uh, another thing that we were looking for is just a, uh, we weren't looking to save money on the changeover. We were looking for a lot of feature enhancements. So essentially, our sales force wanted to have a much better communication system. They wanted it tied into their mobile phones. Uh, and even better if it could be tied in in such a way that they don't have to use their own number and forevermore get phone calls from our customers on their cell phone. Uh, and just the ability to have all of the communications kind of merge in, you know, unified communications, oddly enough. Um, and it's really consumer IT that has informed most of our staff as to what is possible. And we all know how enterprise solutions generally aren't as flexible or functional. However, we were very pleasantly supplied, surprised. The, once I started looking at it and realized that a VoIP system would let us have this as a hosted solution that we didn't have to manage directly, uh, I got really excited. And uh, John Turley at Asus, I contacted him fairly early on in the process of finding solutions. And we looked at a lot of other hosted uh, VoIP solutions as well. Uh, they were just starting to come out with the, a fully hosted uh, service. And I think we were probably one of the first customers there. But it's, we have one IT ops manager and we have a lot of servers that he has to manage. So we're trying to keep his uh, overhead as low as possible. Uh, and yeah, just less to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, in reviewing the options, ASUS being an open source, so therefore we have the potential if we ever wanted to bring it in-house and extend it directly, if we ever got to that level of customer support that we needed, uh, was a, a nice to have feature, but not a requirement. Uh, one of the things that we did as part of the deployment is we had a test server that was set up you know, a month or so ahead of time. We didn't do a lot of planning uh, before this. We did some, and we did a lot of testing. And the nice thing about this is we had a completely separate phone system that was set up in parallel while we had our other phone system working. And we were able to, you know, uh, set up a few hard desk phones as well as use the Bria client. Uh, and John was nice enough to set us up with a um, PSTN connection. So. Everything was tested, everything worked. We could see pretty much from our environment how things were going to go. And it worked out very well. The one surprise that we had, and we have Windows, Mac, and Linux uh, users in our environment, I did not expect as many people to want to use the soft client as we turned out to be the case. More, about half of our company decided to go with soft phones instead of having a desk phone. Uh, and that shows how mobile and how laptop-centric we are now. Uh, the, we did have some difficulty getting the Linux user set up with a SIP client. I think one bailed out and went with a desk, to, a desk phone, and the other one uh, stuck it through and managed to get his system set up. Uh, and the other thing that we noticed as part of the planning, kind of the minimal planning that we did, is almost everybody has a cell phone. The, our previous system was never really exercised heavily. We're not a high voice um, phone touch company. It's mostly, most of our communications go through email. So if anything really bad happened, we could always bail out to cell phones, at least temporarily. So that gave us a bit of a safety net. Uh, what we found is that the call quality is um, generally higher. Uh, and 
much crisper, easier to understand. And since we do a lot of uh, TCs, teleconferences, this is invaluable. Uh, and we, in the process, also upgraded our conference phones to a much higher quality with HD voice. And that has also helped, up, helped out um, very much. Uh, the audio conferencing works very well, but we're still, you know, we just rolled out in December and we're still trying to get people aware that it exists. And this is a key part of reducing our overall spend. Uh, instead of using our more expensive audio conferencing system, we can use our uh, conference built into the phone. And that was actually a key feature that pointed us towards ASUS um, versus some other solutions, because uh, it was so well set up. Uh, we're, we've seen a few uh, DOS attacks, so they're, they're rolling out an update, to hopefully this week or next week, that will uh, help fix some of that. And we were pleasantly surprised that it was actually less expensive. So the management overhead versus the previous PBX, since it was a mature and, and we basically never touched it and didn't have very many features, is currently a little bit higher. But as we get the rest of the kinks uh, worked out, we expect it to be actually much lower with a lot more functionality and features. So very successful switchover, uh, very easy. John Gerlay and his team made this uh, a very painless process. We're finding that the soft phones are still quite challenging for most users, even though half our company went this way. Quite a few of them managed to went ahead and switched over to a hard phone. And it wasn't because the soft phone didn't work very well. It's really the interface on the soft phone uh, we're using the Bria client is not very good. So there's still a lot of opportunity out there to improve that. Uh, love being able to set up a desk phone and just ship it out or give it to somebody so they can take home and they're tied into our network. Uh, that is fantastic. And um, yeah, we spent more time and effort in selecting the system and actually rolling it out, which is a testament to how well um, ASUS did. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, William. John? Thank you. Hi. Uh, I'm John Fulton from Lafayette College, which is a small liberal arts college in eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, it has a pretty low uh, faculty to student ratio, 10.5 uh, to 1. Um, uh, it's also an engineering college. Um, I, um, uh, I work in central ITS, um, who provides most of the IT services. We're small enough that central IT works. Um, we run the network. We host the servers, we host an ERP, we do authentication on OpenLDAP, web hosting. We have a department uh, dedicated to instructional technology, which focuses on how faculty can use uh, technology with their teaching. And we have a, uh, a regular help desk. Um, also, we have computer science majors who um, end up working with me. And one of them is um, actually contributing some code upstream. And more are interested. Um, so that's a real a benefit that I see the feature I want, I suggest it, and it gets done. And it, I, I hope you benefit from it. Um, it's a small thing. Um, basically, provisioning Bria for the mobile phone. Um, and we are endowment driven. Um, so um, I've, heard, I've heard a lot of people say that they, you know, a, a nice benefit of, of Isus is that it's cheaper. And that's a benefit for us, too. We don't want to waste our money. But um, my point is that we didn't just choose it because um, it was cheaper than Cisco. We actually chose it over it because it had better features, which I'll, which I'll get to. Um, so um, our ITS staff, um, this is my group specifically, our systems administration experience is in Red Hat. Um, so all of our server, well, 80% of our servers are virtualized on Rev. That's Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization. We're not using VMware to virtualize. Um, we have two data centers, and we run our services in high availability between them. And our network is highly segregated um, by MPLS. So we have over 10 firewall contexts. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Now, telephony was provided outside of ITS. I am not a, I am new to phones, um, and, and so are my staff. Um, but um, we, as, as mentioned in a, in a presentation earlier, we, we, we took it on as another service. And um, I think within a year, we feel very comfortable with the system. Um, the Avaya Definity G3 is still at the college, still in production. We're uh, in the first phase of moving to this new system. But it's about 20 years old. 
um, and the Alcatel voicemail system, and people are, everyone who's on the new system prefers it much more. Um, so the philosophy driving our project was let's not just do dial tone, uh, which is why I've been emphasizing the call the project unified communications as opposed to just VoIP. Um, because it's, it's more than dial tone. We really wanted video, we wanted presence in IM, and we wanted a much better voicemail system and getting your voicemail and your email. Everyone's been very happy with that. And we also wanted one soft phone that had all these features. So that was, I mean, that's one thing that Bria got right for us. Um, it worked on all these other platforms and the other vendors competing actually didn't have it working on all the platforms. And they're, they're just about there, but I mean, we're, we're a year in. Um, so the criteria we used to select our UC platform, we were you know, specifically interested in feature qualities. That's what was driving it. Uh, it's a nice benefit that, you know, that we, we want to be reasonable with our money. The cost is there, but that's not what drove us to eZeus. Um, we also wanted to minimize our risk of investment. So if we buy this thing and it doesn't work out, what's the exit strategy? You know, how much will we lose? And uh, we wanted something that would fit well with our skills and infrastructure. So we RFP'd uh, our design. We basically wrote a document saying what all of our, our ideal UC system would be. We sent it to Cisco and Avaya, and we sent it to eZeus. Um, and then we evaluated uh, the RFP based on the, uh, the features above. Um, so what we were specifically looking at was the hard phones, uh, how the voicemail worked, how the soft phone worked, how the video conferencing worked, the architecture that they proposed. So I mean, we have engineers who were very particular about how it would be to run such a thing, um, how support would be from the company, what our initial investment would be, total cost of ownership, the uh, solutions integrator, um, how it worked with mobility, and, and we did also think about company stability. Um, so these were quali these are uh, some of these were uh, qualitative features. So we had everyone uh, participating in our initial pilot uh, rank things from zero to four, um, and basically rate what they thought of these systems. So Avaya, we had we had everyone set up for the pilot. We actually had Avaya rolled in a big rack and several engineers into our data center, and they configured it. And they actually ran into a lot of problems getting it up and running with our firewalls. Um, because we lock things down as tightly as uh, we can without breaking things. Um, uh, we called up, let's see, we talked to Mike Pichet, and he, he spun up an instance in EC2, and we were up and running pretty quickly. Um, uh, then after trying it out a bit, we actually just took one day and installed it on a VM and got it all working. We used VoIP.ms, um, so we bought a few dids from them and, and forwarded it in, and then we forwarded our desk phones there and I basically lived on Bria and a, uh, a headset for a while, making sure you know that I liked the system. So, uh, so we had a bunch of people in ITS doing this, and we um, basically evaluated these things. So these are subjective ratings, um, but those those are basically how the numbers came out with the people who had tried it out. Um, which you know I can't be telling to write it all down and and, and, and plot it. Um, we also considered the, um, the responses to the RFP and broke them into common categories. So, uh, you know, the servers and infrastructure that we're going to need. Now, ESUS didn't want to sell us servers, but we were going to need servers to do this. Um, the professional services, the gateways, uh, soft phones, server licensing, hard phones and such. And when you break everything into these categories and then try to com try and make it more of an apples to apples comparison, uh, we actually found that the, uh, the competitors were 50% more costly uh, than Isus for the initial investment. And then the cost over time, so every year it was going to cost us three times what it would with uh, Cisco, and, and, and actually Avaya was even more. Um, so that's what we would have to plan for our OPEX budget to maintain the system. Um, and it was just, these are just some interesting things I found as I, I made these pie charts. Um, just that, for some reason, Avaya soft phones were the largest cost. Uh, in Cisco's case, they wanted the most, they had the most expensive uh, charge for professional <coughs> services. So, maybe it's difficult to, I don't know. Um, Isus's professional services were actually the lowest of the three. And um, the, the largest cost component for Isus was the, uh, the licensing. As you know, they have a simple licensing model. But we're in Edu, and now they have this new uh, AGP uh, licensing, which makes this even more compelling if you're an edu to, to look at this. 
Um, with respect to risk, I mean, we were focused on here. I'm, I'm defining my, 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 my terms for high risk and low risk, right? The total goods and services that cannot be reused if I change my vendor versus what can I reuse. So these are percentages based on what was for sale and what was proprietary and what I could reuse. Um, we actually did find out we could, we could reuse all the hard phones. So if I bought a Bio phone versus Polycom phones versus Cisco phones, they would work with the rest of the system. Um, so that was nice. Um, we, um, I, obviously you can't reuse services. Um, the, the thing with, we were looking at the, the proposal we had uh, via Flare tablets, um, and we were looking at Cisco CS tablets versus, I don't want to get my people that, they all have iPads. They love their iPad, and I just want to install an app on their iPad. Um, so that, you know, that made that simple. Um, again, the soft phones, uh, Brio would, would work. Um, and, then, and then there was a, the additional case that E911, there was a proprietary E911 system. We actually are using uh, Conveyant, or I should say we have bought Conveyant and are in the process of <coughs> planning to deploy it. Um, so, um, I mean, I've, I've, I've talked to people and they're like, oh, well, are you sure you want to use Isus? They're a new company, they're not, you know, is that a, like a risky thing? I mean, I think it's less risky. <laughs> For these reasons, precisely because it's all based on open source and open standard, you have a lot of components to reuse if things don't work out, though they've worked out very well for us. Uh, and finally, it fit well into our infrastructure and skills. Uh, so we had one of these things where, oh yes, that's supported on Rev. So that, that was nice to know. Um, we are 100% virtualized. Um, we could just, I, I love that it was just using RPMs for package management, and that to install it, I just used YUM, which is, that's, that saves us a ton of time. Um, so we're already leveraging our existing Linux skills. So instead of having this uh, magical black box which does everything perfectly and I just have to look at the pretty GUI and hit the reload button and hope, I can actually SSH into the server and use all these commands that my staff and I know to figure out what's really going on. Um, so all the, the Linux tools for all the other services we run, we could just apply them to phones. So it made it a more natural fit. Um, so this is our, this is just a quick diagram of our network. This is, um, Mike Pache earlier this morning did uh, a presentation that involved two case studies. And our, our system is actually a lot like his second example, where you have multiple SIP proxy servers, you have a config server, uh, you have two media servers. They are replicated between two data centers. The key difference uh, is just that we're using Red, not VMware. And in our case, um, all the SIP and all the RT GP traffic goes through our SBC, which is an ACME. Um, so we have, we have two ACMEs and we're able to do live failover between calls and the users uh, don't notice. And, um, and we can you know, we can talk more about it if you're curious. Um, so we um, selected pilot users. So I, I, there's been like several phases of, of pilot. First it was just a few of us and then we added more people. And now I mean, we bought the thing and we want to pilot it to the rest of campus. Um, of course, we moved all of ITS over um, and it, it went pretty smoothly. Um, and then we picked departments who use the phone a lot to really, uh, just, just because we felt very confident in the system that I wanted to go after the people who really depend on the phone, such as development and alumni relations and athletics, uh, our communications department and public safety. Um, so uh, we, one, one thing we did was we, we, we got all the secretaries together from the departments because they're the ones on the front line taking all the calls and they're the ones who are gonna have you know, strong opinions about how the phone system should work. So they're, they're gonna be more picky and they're going to share their experience with others in the office. Um, so it was a good idea to, to, we invited them all and, and got them some coffee and you know, just had a little meeting. We showed them OpenUC and, and, and the UC features and um, you know, we asked them what they would like in phones and we, we paid a lot of attention to those features uh, and, and made sure we addressed those things when we converted them. One of them being, you know, all the multiple lines are bound to a particular phone so I can take so-and-so's call if they're out and knowing who, who's out. Um, so, and then um, we had them all agree in advance to come to a training session where we would cut the departments over. They came in, they got to play with their polycoms in the OpenUC web, web interface. And uh, meanwhile, we had our, our implementer, who was Ronco, do a place and set the next day so that when they, I'm sorry, the same day, so that when they got back to their office, there's my new phone I just learned how to use. Um, it went pretty smoothly. 
Um, so we're one year into a three-year project. We have 150 users, but we're going to have over 1,000 for sure because we're going to get all faculty and staff. Um, we have students on the system. Um, so, I mean, that was a really nice thing for us was to get the, uh, the college's core mission is education. Um, so does this enhance teaching and learning? That's you know, a more abstract question. But the better I can tie that in with the system, the better I can tie it to our core mission. Um, so I, I'm happy to say that we have students uh, using this in a class. So they're taking a writing class where they um, need to interact with writing associates who are basically upperclassmen who they have one-on-one -on -one consultations with. And each student must meet with a writing associate four times in the semester, times the number of students. So that's a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings. So what we are doing is we're making half of those meetings occur over a video uh, using Bria. So I went into the classroom full of students. The professor let me set up, and I gave them their, uh, their, their Lafayette extension and pin and plugged it in with Bria provisioning, and it just worked. And they actually all figured themselves out in like less than 30 minutes. They were up and running, video chat, video, uh, whoops, <laughs> video chat, making calls. Um, so then the plan is for, you know, through the semester, they will interact with uh, online with Bria, uh, as opposed to meeting face to face for certain meetings. And then you know, I'm going to ask them to compare them. Um, so, the, and the other thing that's nice uh, for a student experience is that because it's open source, I just, I know, I have a CS major and he's pretty smart. And I just said, oh, here's your Linux laptop. Install this thing, figure it out, because I want this feature. Figure out how to do this. And you could just install it, and there was no licensing issues. It was just, he just installed SIPX, um, figured out how to do it, read the documentation. So, I mean, uh, it's a good benefit for him for his resume because he's now working on code in the real world that other people will hopefully use. So, those are my two favorite things about the project. Though, I mean, Obviously, the, the time savings and re retiring the old PBX are also very good. Um, so uh, my lessons learned. Um, make sure your place and set vendor will do the requirements gathering. So we're going to do this in phase two. We're going to make that part of our request that if you want to run around our campus giving people's phones, I want you to meet with the office first and find out all their particular special needs for who is binding what line to what phone, who forwards, and all that kind of thing. Uh, get that worked out. Otherwise, you'll be making it up on the fly, and it might take more time than you anticipated. Um, whiteboard with Isus and ask questions until you're convinced that the implementation details are correct. Uh, we, we did this, but I just think it was a very good thing. Um, like, Pichet came down, and we, we whiteboarded. And he convinced us that we should use the DNS server <laughs> built into the system instead of bind. I mean, we're still using bind, but we didn't fully understand how college will write it with SRV records. Um, and then, um, uh, like, like the presentation Mike did earlier, again, we inserted uh, OpenUC into the uh, existing PBX in the right spot. Um, so our three PRIs go into uh, our existing Definity, and then we have four PRIs going into an audio codex box, and then IP. And then we <coughs> delete a extension from the uh, Definity, and then it finds its way over to the CIVX box. So, thank you. I think we've got a few minutes for questions and answers before we wrap up. Does anyone in the audience have some questions for the panel? <laughs> Talk to us.